Our next speaker is Alfred Nordman, who is both Professor of Philosophy and History of Science at Darmstadt Technical University in Germany and the apparently permanently visiting centen centenary professor in the philosophy department at the University of South Carolina in the US. Professor Nordman has published 12 books and more than 100 articles on such a diverse array of topics as aesthetics, drama, Hertz, Wittgenstein, contemporary analyses of models, simulations, and visualizations, and of course, nanoscience. Regarding the last, he has been studying the philosophical and societal dimensions of nanoscience and converging technologies since 2000. And he and Davis Baird initiated the first NSF-sponsored research team on the subject. His topic today is the shape of knowledge about nanoparticles on the discrepancy between what we want and what we get. Thank you very much. Also, thank you for the invitation to this conference. Uh, I will follow some of the previous speakers. In that, I will actually be perhaps a bit fearless, quite literally, and maybe crude. Um, okay. And I will also, uh, like, uh, like others before me, tell you quickly where I'm coming from, uh, in both a kind of intellectual but also a more physical sense. And let's see. Uh, one of the institutions, in a certain sense, that I represent is called, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, uh, the Nano Office, the Office for Interdisciplinary Nanotechnology Studies in, um, in Darmstadt. It's a very small kind of place. But I want to still indicate that it's an interesting place in the sense that here it is not uh, social scientists uh, or regulators or policy people, but actually philosophers of science who are asked to do certain kinds of things that we might not normally be expected to do. So uh, the basis of our work, though, is what I would call a philosophy of nanotechnoscience. And, uh, and what that means is very much the same thing as you would have philosophy of physics, or philosophy of chemistry, or just philosophy of science in general. So philosophy of nanotechnoscience is very largely concerned with what is, uh, in terms of research practice, in terms of the knowledge produced, in terms of standards of objectivity, in terms of methodology and so forth. What is nanotechnological research? Uh, but we also do other things, and this is part of the phenomenon, I think, of a, a nanotechnology in its own right. People have pointed out previously that nanotechnology is special in the sense that people started very early on to incorporate a very wide variety of actors. And I think uh, the fact that people like us are involved in so many different activities is part of the phenomenon that we are here reflecting on. So I've been involved in projects that had to do with capacity building for trade unions and environmental NGOs about nanotechnology. We've generated a study uh, for the German government on models for the regulation of nanotechnologies, and I may talk about this at the very end. And one should also point out, just as a kind of aside, because for some of you it might be new that there's even an, a journal that's called Nanoethics, and for some of you it might be new that there's a society that has been formed last year uh, that is called the Society for the Study of Nanoscience and Emerging Nanotechnologies, uh, which uh, will be having its second meeting this year in Darmstadt. So what is this special place, though, in terms of, in some sense, intellectual location? There is a kind of familiar model that you might be, that many people are also expecting and always bringing to the philosophers. And the familiar model comes, in some sense, from a different realm, especially the realm of medical ethics and bioethics. And according to that familiar model, there's, first of all, philosophy. And then within philosophy, you have something called ethics or philosophical ethics. And then it evolved, evolved something that is now called applied ethics, including medical ethics, bioethics. And here we have ethical perspectives being brought on a very special kind of also new development, new therapies, new phenomena, reproductive technologies, and so forth. So this is one model. But I think in nanotechnology, interestingly enough, again, that is part of the phenomenon that we're talking about, there is a slightly different model. Philosophy of science and science studies uh, have been very much involved, and of course, many people speaking here today, Kevin and uh, David, uh, two examples, have been very much involved in the kind of societal and ethical deliberations. So, and it begins, in some sense, really with the question, what is nanotechnology? And the idea is that conceiving and understanding issues uh, 
uh, that are of ethical and societal significance requires, to some extent, a previous appreciation of what is nanotechnology in the first place and how it evolves in society. So I will also, for this talk here, proceed with a somewhat arrogant assumption, and you can call me upon it later or tell me whether it's arrogant, that in some sense, regulation and policy and societal and ethical deliberation make no sense at all if they are not cognizant of the complexities of nanoscale phenomena and the kind of knowledge that can be obtained in this uh, about nano phenomena. So for example, a very familiar phrase that one hears a lot in many reports and so forth, which might run like this, products containing nanomaterials should not be marketed until proven safe. I mean, this is a kind of statement that comes easy, uh, but it's a statement of which I would argue it has no traction in the current kind of world that we are, we, are, we are deliberating on. And so when we are having conferences like these, it's really about finding ways to kind of substitute this statement with something more reasonable. Okay, now, when we are asking the question until proven safe, for example, there's a lot of philosophical jargon in there already, the notion of proof, for example. And that's where philosophers come to the fore very, very quickly because one of the things we do and have traditionally done is kind of reflect not only on the kind of knowledge that is produced and how knowledge is produced, but also, of course, we like to look at the limits of knowledge. And there's been a famous uh, quote that I give you here uh, where you might say that despairing of biology ever becoming a, pr a proper science and maybe being wrong about that, the philosopher Immanuel Kant exclaimed, where, will there ever be the Newton of a blade of grass? Uh, you, you, uh, this, you may have heard this quote before, and some people say, well, Darwin came and he was the Newton of the blade of gra 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 grass. But the reason why I put this quote up is because it, uh, I had an encounter in 2005 which had an in interesting resonance to that, namely despairing of the possibility to classify nanoparticles according to all these various dimensions that we heard about, composition, size, shape, and so forth, a discussant, and this was not a philosopher, but a scientist, at a 2005 nanomaterials workshop explained, will there ever be the Linnaeus of nanoparticles? And with the same kind of assumption that probably we will not see this person, and so what now? So how do we go on from here? And that will be the question that I'm asking for now. And, uh, and, and I will begin by saying just a few words of what I consider to be the philosophy of nanotechnoscience. Uh, and, uh, and again, there should be a lot more said here, but I'll just point out one or two things that might be relevant. So as a matter of practice, you might say, most nano research is not oriented towards development and improvement of theory, but towards what I would call acquisition and demonstration of basic capabilities. And, uh, and here, the word basic is not unimportant, especially in an academic context. It is a kind of basic research, but it's not a basic research that's mostly looking at, at theory. But these are basic capabilities of measurement, visualization, manipulation, and simulation, for example. Um, so this is a kind of observation which I don't have time to defend here. But secondly, and kind of corresponding to it perhaps, there's also very little expectation uh, that, or only few people express such expectations or even demands, that uh, there are specific laws that govern phenomena at the nanoscale. Laws, for instance, uh, uh, governing uh, structure property relations specific specifically at the nanoscale. So generally speaking, the assumption is that we have a lot of knowledge from sort of classical physics and chemistry, and we have a lot of knowledge from quantum physics and chemistry, and somehow, if we kind of stretch from both directions, we can kind of account for phenomena at the nano scale. But there is nothing, in some sense, very specific, lawful, uh, that governs this particular complex uh, mesocosm, as it has been called. Now, these two observations taken together have, of course, already some implications for the possibility of obtaining predictive knowledge about nanoparticle uh, toxicity. And, and actually obtaining the kind of knowledge that is often or regularly required or expected by society and by policymakers for regulatory purposes. And this again, this implication that maybe we need to be skeptical about the Linnaeus of nanoparticles, but also skeptical about obtaining predictive knowledge about nanoparticle toxicity, um, is uh, underscored by certain observations I think that many people would be ready to make, but maybe I'm also ignorant here and need to be educated. But I would speak about slow or no progress regarding characterization, classification, 
consistent reproducibility of nanoparticles, and also, I mean, in light of the long time horizons that are anticipated by the experts themselves for some things like safe handling of nanomaterials. So all of this together casts a kind of uh, shadow over the prospect of quickly obtaining the kind of information that would quickly enable us to do uh, the regulatory business as usual. So we get a kind of discrepancy, and this is what I mean now by the shape of knowledge and the discrepancy between what we want and what we get. So what we would like, and again, I mean, the we here is a kind of vague we that certainly uh, uh, includes many citizens groups or the trade unions and NGOs that I re referred to earlier. It also includes many uh, policymakers and, and regulators and so forth. What we would like is something like, well, risk assessment, proper risk assessment, where we have very definite knowledge about the relations between dosage, exposure, and response, things like that. Uh, what we would like is statements of a certain kind of form, like this class of nanomaterial product ingredients is safe up to some kind of specific, specified threshold, uh, which would then somehow allow us to set standards and regulatory guidelines. So in this shape of sentence, you know, there is here already a kind of generalization that we'd like to make statements about classes uh, of nanomaterials, or at least uh, uh, even uh, to at least at least pick out by 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 clear characterization and um, and classification uh, specific nanomaterials that we can group together, uh, about which we say things. That we we also look at them ideally as kind of ingredients, as if uh, ideally, for instance, all carbon nanotubes that have that kind of look alike in physical chemical ter terms, ideally these carbon nanotubes should somehow be safe in all different contexts, whether they're being used in LCD screens or on computer chips or in baseball bats. Um, so this is an, another sort of assumption here. And then of course, it is supposed to be a kind of statement, a verdict that has a kind of authority based on perhaps a lawful, uh, a lawful statement. So this is what we want. I mean, this is the kind of knowledge that I think people are, in some sense, waiting for and expecting and asking about. But what we get is something more like this, right? We get demonstrations of achieved results. Uh, this is highly useful and valuable information, but it somehow doesn't quite meet the demand that is expected. So we find things like we have shown that a dispersion of nanoparticles in water can lead to the accumulation of nanoparticles in the brains of fish or we can identify a pathway that constitu constitutes a potential hazard, or we cannot discern any adverse effects, and so forth. So we find a lot of different kinds of results that are all generated in response to a knowledge demand, but taken together, these different kinds of knowledges, I'll use the plural here, these different kinds of results and findings don't add up to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to answer the original question. This is, of course, not a very typical situation, not specific to nanotechnology at all, where new technologies create a demand for knowledge and subsequently lots of relevant and valuable knowledge is produced, but it does not straightforwardly add up to meet the demand. And this is where we need to say that when we talk about adding up the knowledge that has been obtained, it thereby also kind of moves out of the domain of science proper. So it's to the extent that it, the scientific information doesn't just add up to answer our questions, it is somehow the responsibility falls back upon society and social actors to then say, well, so what do we make of the stuff that we are being told? Um, so uh, I would argue that uh, principles like the no market for nanomaterials and the proven same, safe do not gain traction in this setting. Uh, and neither does, for instance, a retreat to case by case or one nanoparticle at a time kind of uh, uh, um, principle, which again would have to struggle very much with the question of what does it even mean, one nanoparticle at a time, how does one individuate uh, uh, in the absence of certain kinds of, uh, lit one probably doesn't mean literally one nanoparticle, right? You want to kind of, you want to kind of group them together and then we, have, we are back to some, some conceptual issues. So the question that I'm really asking is now how do we then deal with this discrepancy that I'm talking about. So what to do? I think there are three things that one can do. The first thing that one could do is wait for scientific knowledge that may never come. And that may actually introduce a kind of state of paralysis. And I'm 
often struck by how many people actually do express this. And, uh, and, I th uh, and, uh, and in some sense, I thought that Ralph Hall's presentation this morning gave us a wonderful illustration of this. Because what he was doing, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting you totally, but what you're doing is kind of pointing out the complexity of it, talking about all the unanswerable questions or unanswered questions, but at the same time with a kind of rhetorical flourish that showed that these are extremely complex uh, things that where it's not very likely to get a straightforward answer anytime soon. Uh, so in some sense, we give this litany of unanswered questions, and then we say, well, but if you can't answer me the, those questions, I need the answers in order to do what I have to do, namely to regulate. So, uh, so, uh, so this, I think, very nicely illustrated somehow the impasse that I'm talking about, where a certain business has to be done, uh, and it requires a certain kind of knowledge, and, uh, and uh, there's only a dim awareness that maybe this, this kind of knowledge as such will not be forthcoming any time soon or maybe never. So, so the question is how does one maybe move on and not be paralyzed by this condition? So, um, so there is, of course, a notion of waiting in a precautionary fashion, fashion and, uh, and I can't go into this right now, what that actually involves. I think for the, for the time being, I would argue that, um, that it is just a very conflicted state to be in, uh, and I don't want to go into notions of precaution right here and what's the difficulty with that. But for instance, on this notion, for example, uh, certain uh, one always kind of teeters on the brink of calling for a moratorium, for example, because um, if, if one takes uh, one's notions literally. But I think there's another way, and I think it's actually the way that society has chosen, namely that is the learn as we go along way. I think this is the de facto of a way in which uh, we are proceeding as societies in Europe and the United States and everywhere else with nanotechnologies. Uh, so, but the question with that particular way is, how can we be sure that we're actually learning as we're going along? Um, and that's what the rest of my talk will mostly focus on. But first, I want to, uh, to quickly point out another kind of discrepancy, which may actually be an, another symptom of the first one. And this is this one. And I, I hear it sometimes expressed uh, uh, in policy circles more, more than. So toxicologists always know just enough about potential hazards to conclude that more toxicological research is needed. But it seems that they never know or worry enough to say no to anything. Uh, again, I might be wrong here, and someone has said no to something in a very loud way. But, uh, but for the most part, I think this is a reasonable characterization. And, just so that you don't think I'm just putting the blame on others, I think we can easily put the word ethicists in here and we will get the same, the same answer or the same kind of pattern. Ethicists always know just enough to say that we need more ethics research. Uh, and that's it often. Um, so is this now just a complaint about potential conflicts of interest and potentially self-serving research? Um, again, I would... Uh, be guilty of that myself. Um, so it, it does actually raise an interesting question which I will not pursue here, namely who should be the judge whether more research is needed once, uh, once certain results are being presented. Uh, should that judgment be done by those who have just produced the research? Um, so, but, uh, but there is another question here, uh, which again ties in close, more closely with my interest in nanotechnoscience uh, and the philosophy of it, uh, namely, uh, maybe this symptom that I'm describing here, this uh, is due in part again to the fact that the research questions themselves are framed in such a way that one will always fall short of producing the knowledge of the desired shape of regularity and conclusiveness. So in some sense, if you're pursuing an un unobtainable goal, uh, then you're always going to end up saying, well, we've gotten a little ways, we've found out, yeah, we found out something, but of course, more research needs to be done. Okay, so how do this, uh, how should we think about this learning as we go along? Um, I have two requirements that I want to talk about. The first requirement I think for a successful learning process is not to fixate on these unattainable goals. In other words, not to be par paralyzed by an expectation that will not be met. So that is an one, one example of this, which I find is a, an important one, is I think we have to move beyond what I would call the idealized chemicals paradigm, to kind of treat nanomaterials as chemicals and try to assimilate the regulation 
of nanomaterials as much as possible to what we know about regulation of chemicals, as in REACH, for example, the European uh, 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 Chemicals Regulation Regime. So I would say don't focus exclusively or too heavily on the idea of pre-market determinations of safety of materials, ingredients in a range of products. So this is, uh, was expressed in that earlier idea. But I'm also saying don't give up on that idea. I mean, I think it's a valuable idea to hold on to. I mean, this is what we, in the best of all worlds, want, a pre-market kind of determination of safety. So it's, uh, so, so, but we can't put all our eggs in that basket if uh, we can't get the, the answers that we need. So that's I'm saying don't focus too heavily, but don't therefore give up on the idea. Why do I call it an idealized chemical paradigms? For two reasons, one was already mentioned, that actually even the chemicals regulation doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, provide, uh, it doesn't, uh, isn't satisfied for many, many, many chemicals. Uh, so, uh, so it's, uh, in some sense, a paradigm that is uh, already restricted to a certain class of chemicals. Uh, but also, I think uh, this idealized chemicals paradigm is itself uh, oriented towards an even more idealistic paradigm of perfect knowledge, in a some, some sense, of uh, pre-market uh, knowledge about introduction of new products, and that would be the pharmaceuticals paradigm, where you actually have the clinical studies and all this, all this business. I mean, that's somehow the gold standard of, of, of of, of proceeding in a safe way before introducing a new product to, into the market. Um, but, uh, but I would argue that this way is not applicable to nanomaterials, but probably also the, the, the chemicals paradigm is not. So what should we do instead? And I'm now giving just a whole list of things. And this is an open-ended list, and as you will find out, one of the things that this list has in common is that it doesn't really matter whether we are talking about nano anymore. I mean, you might be interested in uh, nanomaterials, uh, but in the end, uh, many of these considerations uh, can, uh, should enter in regardless of what we, how def we define nanotechnology. So for instance, one thing one should consider is, in some sense, mobilize the product's testing paradigm. So think of it more in terms of t uh, looking at nanomaterials in the context of a specific product. Uh, so the carbon nanotubes in the LCD screen or whatever, well, which, which, which would then not be an LCD screen, but, uh, but you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, or the nanomaterials, uh, the carbon nanotubes in the computer chips. So let's look at the product context. Uh, not one nanoparticle at a time, but in a some sense, but uh, one product at a time. Uh, this would actually allow, this is just a side point, that uh, the functional requirements for a product uh, where uh, might still have, in some sense, a lot of tolerance for, for s slight variations in the specific uh, uh, character of, uh, of the nanomaterials used, which might then actually span a range of ecotoxicological eco properties. I think to, uh, if, if one really takes seriously the idea that, that toxicological properties and other properties of nanoparticles might be extremely closely associated to specific surface characteristics, to specific size, to specific shape, and so forth, then, uh, then we will never find a product, I think, that, uh, that will be where we will have literally sort of identical nanoparticles in each of the products. Whereas in, but in product testing, we would be in encountering, in some sense, the range of nanoparticles that make this product work. And this is, in some sense, ultimately what we're interested in as a society, whether the product is safe or not, uh, as we, of course, already start consuming it and so forth. Um, so we are more interested in how the product works than how the, whether the, the nanomaterials in the product are, by definition or per se, safe materials. Uh, second thing that would follow from this is that nanoparticles are not what I would call chemicals plus, which is often how they're kind of thought about of chemicals plus, so chemical composition plus size, shape, surface characteristics. Uh, in particular, nanomaterials, as we also heard this morning already in our first presentation, have very significant, perhaps, or may have significant biological properties, uh, and perhaps not just when DNA and virus-like uh, structures are used as building blocks. We heard about DNA origami uh, earlier. So 
so this idea that somehow we look at nanoparticles just from the chemistry angle rather than from the biology angle uh, is perhaps a limiting idea. Um, limiting idea also might be why do we restrict our investigations to engineered nanoparticles when there's much to learn, for example, from nanoparticles in welder's fumes. Just to give one example where uh, it is possible that these nanoparticles are actually responsible for respiratory distress and so forth and where there's already a long history of dealing with, uh, with uh, uh, minimizing exposure and so forth. So um, then I think another part would be, these are just uh, interesting, challenging questions. Uh, what to make of simulation toxicology, uh, uh, using simulation, up initio simulations, whatever to model, uh, to model uh, toxicological pathways and, uh, and events. Um, or, or, sorry for the typo, how to deal with agglomeration. Um, is this just another specific property of nanoparticles that may have to be investigated? Uh, and that would then again lead to a kind of more product testing approach because uh, nanoparticles may agglomerate differently in different contexts of use and so forth and different uh, environments, literally. Um, so, so there are lots of questions that one can ask here. These are not questions to just show, as we heard earlier, that this is all a very, very complicated story and that one needs a whole lot of knowledge before one can actually make any kind of clear determinations. But it's also a proposal that there are many sources of knowledge that can be drawn upon or that should be drawn upon where we don't actually necessarily expect that they all add up in a very straightforward way to some narrow definition of nanoparticles and a narrow de determination of the safety or non-safety of these particles in, in, in some sense in a kind of pure form. So another question, of course, would be, and this leads me to my other consideration, my final consideration, is, uh, is to say, what can we learn all from already ongoing discussions of nanosilver, uh, which I think are very interesting discussions. I don't know whether they've really been studied so much yet, um, because, uh, because these discussions have gone very far beyond considerations just of risk, uh, to, uh, both to the environment and to humans. Uh, but they are highly contextualized. I think one of the major undercurrents in the discussion of nanosilver is what are the benefits of these uh, applications? Do we need the famous nanosilver socks and so forth? Uh, is this actually a, a kind of uh, improvement of some sort that we would want? And, uh, and these kinds of highly contextual considerations are also here informing a very critical debate which shows, again, one way in which society can move beyond the problem of just adding up uh, uh, toxicological information. All right, so the second point, and this is again already the last point, or I don't know, finally the last point uh, of this presentation about how do we do this learning as we go along process. Uh, uh, that when I say that in order to learn as we go along, we need uh, lots of different kinds of data and input and evidences, um, and we shouldn't necessarily expect that they add up. We also need, in some sense, institutional settings in which observation, collecting, and interpretation of various kinds of evidence can take place. Uh, so the motto for all of this would be, we can't promise that nothing asbestos-like will happen with some nanomaterials, but we do promise that we will catch it a lot faster this time around. So, uh, so this seems to be, if you are talking about a kind of social contract between the, the, uh, the kind of promoters of nanotechnology and society at large. This seems to be the promise that is being made. Uh, no one at this point is promising that nothing harmful will come uh, or that it could be that we have the knowledge to, to exclude that. Uh, but everyone seems to be promising that we are really, really vigilant this time around and that we are setting up a whole system of observation that allows us to catch things uh, fast. Uh, I, I refer to this sometimes as a regime of vigilance, which is being con constructed. And so this is not just what I'm talking about now. It's not just the proposal of how it should be. It's partly that. Uh, but it's also, I think, a description of what's already emerging. So what is this analytic framework for systematic learning in which this promise can be fulfilled? Uh, I think this promise can only be fulfilled if there's a certain kind of acknowledgement or realization of something that Dave Gustin was referring to earlier in re reference to Bruno Latour, namely that we ha the acceptance or the, the acceptance or acknowledgement of the notion that society is 
or has become the laboratory in which pre and post market collective experiments are conducted with emerging technologies. So in principle, in some sense, everyone is implicated in these collective experiments, both as guinea pig as well as experimenter. So we are all, in some sense, by buying the products, by ingesting the stuff, and so forth. We are, the, we are at the same time guinea pigs, but we are also potentially observers of the process, users, learners. Um, so this sounds at first like a, a mere metaphor to say that uh, society is a laboratory. So since we can't have this strict division between pre-market testing and then introduction, we also don't have the strict division between what's going on in the laboratory and what's going on in the society. So it seems like just a metaphor to say, well, the doors of the laboratory have become opened or the, 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 the boundary between laboratory and society has become porous and now we are all implicated. But I think it's more than, than a metaphor and, it, and I th the acknowledgement only makes sense if we take it to be more than a metaphor. Because like all experiments, the trick is here to conduct and observe the experiment in such a way that learning can actually occur. Uh, one theorist or group of theorists talk here a lot about so-called real world experiments. We are performing this experiment already would be the, the, the argument. We are, I mean, there are nano products on the market and there are all kinds of things happening as we also heard in the first lecture this morning. But are we actually learning? And that's the big question. We need this regime of vigilance that I'm talking about to assure or to hope, persuade ourselves that we are in fact set up to learn. Okay, what are the instruments and institutions of learning that we might be talking here about here? So on the one hand, as I mentioned before, there is this expansion in some sense of sources of knowledge, and I don't think they should be sorted strictly according to some definition of what is nanotechnology and what isn't. So, uh, so, so, so maybe we can include experiences with welders' fumes, including also then the experience with the way of, of protecting welders or of atmospheric transport of welders' fumes. I don't know what kind of studies are being done here or not. Um, so this might be just uh, bringing in all the relevant considerations. Then there are also, of course, the old institutions, and I don't think we should underestimate the role of the old institutions, the institutions that are in place and that are working. Uh, just the normal kinds of environmental hazard type regulatory agencies, the EPAs and so forth. Um, so these institutions, uh, even if we say that they might have a hard time coming to terms with the new challenges of nanomaterials, and that actually for much of their work to be done, they don't now have the requisite knowledge perhaps, but they will still have their instruments, they still have their mechanisms and procedures and protocols, and in some sense, they are probing and expanding the effic efficacy of their available tools, and we have to watch that. Uh, so, so I think they can do a lot of the work, probably, that has to do with the regulation of nanoparticles. Uh, and it is an open question whether they can do all the work or how much they're doing, how well they're doing. So the old institutions do play a role in this whole kind of regime of vigilance, and, uh, and, we, and they are part again, part of the experiment, but also part of the observation uh, system. But there are also new institutions evolving, and this is the really interesting part where I'm saying that this is already happening. These new institutions are sometimes called observatories, for example, lots of observatories popping up around the world, observatories of nanotechnology, uh, 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 that uh, uh, the Centers for Nanotechnology and Society, I would argue, are institutions of vigilance in a society. Uh, so the public engagement exercises, the consumer conference, uh, this is the early work on ethical, legal, social aspects is part of the society being engaged in this process of observing how does nanotechnology development actually unfold in our society. Uh, conferences like these, I would argue, are part of the observation of how uh, nanotechnology works in society. Uh, do we think it's working? Um, voluntary guidelines by self-imposed guidelines by companies and so forth. Uh, there are also governance initiatives that might be of interest. I'm not gonna go into this. The European Code of Conduct, for instance, for responsible nanotechnology research has been presented as an instrument to build a kind of core responsibility. It's not a regulatory framework in its own right, but it's a kind of challenge to scientists, to uh, to uh, science organizations, to policymakers in the European member states to respond in a certain way 
uh, and to give meaning to, to very vague principles in part. So, and generally speaking, the whole project here is how do, in the absence of reliable knowledge about regulatory thresholds, how, does, how do societies earn and build trust or how, uh, or how do actors in society earn and build trust in kind of living with this uncertainty? And finally, I have to, this is the last uh, thing that I need to mention quickly. There might be actually new agencies uh, uh, evolving. And I was struck by what uh, Ralph Hall was showing us this morning, the uh, dynamic oversight kind of model where you're saying, you know, we have to look for ways in which we can sort of approximate and still hold on to the kinds of political values that are inherent to our classical regulatory schemes. These are very high political values, and we want to preserve or approximate them as well as we can. We don't just want to surrender them because it's supposedly complex and difficult. So, uh, so we want to approximate those values, so, and we don't want to retreat entirely to the soft mechanisms that are in these new institutions. Right? So do, can we find something that's sort of in the middle? That was very much also our own question, and we came up with an idea of something that we call the scanning probe agency as a kind of, a, a kind of oversight body that would, in some sense, be an, a, a body of experts, including citizen experts, that would look, for example, at how are institutions responding uh, to, uh, to nanotechnology. So you were citing the famous nanomagic case uh, in Germany, the nanomagic case. Uh, it's not really a question of whether it is nanotechnology or not, it doesn't really matter. When it's on the front page of the newspapers as a nano, uh, p potential nanotechnology problem, it becomes a nano issue. So, and now you might have a body of experts which has some kind of agency and authority uh, and that can issue at least recommendations uh, at a high level that might look at how have our institutions performed, how well have, has society been able to deal with this kind of crisis, and so on. So we are arguing anyway that something that's called the scanning probe agency, which involves scanning and probing and being active and having some power, uh, uh, how that might do the trick. But again, this is just the fact that these proposals are being generated, I would argue, is itself part of the phenomenon. And here, with one minute remaining, uh, I stop and thank you. Very nice. I mean, I, I fully agree with that. Uh, and actually, that's one of the, the, actually, it gives me an opportunity to just point out that this is actually one way in which what my presentation often pains regulators. Because I would say, in a sense, what we have to work with is a more or less epidemiological paradigm. Uh, this is part of, it's almost implied in this, um, in this uh, model of uh, collective experimentation. Uh, we just have to have a very good epidemiology, <laughs> ideally. But of course, anyone who has ho higher ideas of being able to determine safety pre-market uh, will, will shy away from that. But I think it's part of the instruments that we need. My question uh, actually is, the, it's, it's surprising to me that your comments came closest to the first time of the question that routinely haunts me is the, is the effect of environmental conditioning on the properties of nanomaterials, and it uh, seems to be a very practical question that, that governs how we test, how we assess, how we understand how these systems interact, and it's, your, your comments came close to that. So I was wondering about proposing that as a straw man, a persistence definition, where the definition of nanomaterials might be based on the persistence of their nanometrology, their nanometric properties, as opposed to distinct bulk-like properties, in, under conditions of which they are Con, uh, conditioned and tested so that aerosolized particles would be conditioned under aerosolized environments and that physiologically exposed particles likewise and food exposed and agricultural exposed and aqua, aqua systems exposed particles might be conditioned and it comes from my observation and I, I beg someone to show me differently where 
real systems coagulate particles very quickly, and it's from the, any analytical chemistry point of view, they lose their nano-specific properties very quickly. The plasmon bands, for example, that have been mentioned many times today, go away very quickly in 10 percent or 5 percent serum-containing media. And many of the systems beyond um, ionic strengths that are uh, found in common buffers will quickly coagulate most nanoparticles in aqueous milieu. So the idea is that conditioning has a lot to do with how we define and how we operatively assess toxicity or risk or exposure, and yet none of those things have been brought up until you, you mentioned them. And I think, it, uh, I think that uh, one of my points tomorrow is that no nanoparticle is a lone actor, that is, that it, it's a collective system, and that our idea is that individual silver nanoparticles are going to be somehow the agents of nefarious death in any system it, is highly distorted, and that these aggregation phenomena and these dispersion and coagulation phenomena are critical to our understanding of these systems. And I just appreciate you brought that up. Thanks. I mean, I fully agree with you about the environmental conditioning and that that's part of what, in some sense, a nanoparticle is in its context. Uh, I'm not so sure about persistence, but maybe I'm misunderstanding something there. I mean, to, I, my, I, we'll have this discussion probably also tomorrow, but to my mind, persistence is also a criterion by which we want to judge nanomaterials. So some people argue that, that if we want to kind of create a, a kind of values for the construction of nanomaterials, uh, persistence or relatively non-persistence should, uh, should be actually one of the uh, features or one of the criteria used, so one wouldn't want to define them. But, but anyway, that's but right. Yeah, <laughs> persistence meaning lifetime, kinetics of okay. lifetime of, of their nano-like oh, okay. properties that that okay. become quickly bulk-like as they re, you know morph back to aggregated states. Okay. Last question for now, Dave. Um, Alfred, um, this was uh, I thought really quite wonderful and, and provocative, and I wanted to give you some more ammunition for the reality of the, uh, the non-metaphor of society as laboratory. Um, and just sort of while this meeting has been going on, the uh, ETC group has issued a, a news release. Um, as huge cloud whitening experiment goes public, Global Coalition urge, uh, urges an immediate halt to geoengineering. Um, and so basically the claim in the, in the press release, and I haven't had time to verify it yet, is that the Gates Foundation is about to spend $300,000 to support a field test of a cloud whitening experiment, um, which, at least according to my very quick click-throughs, could under some definitions be nanotechnology because it involves um, 200 nanometer particles of stuff that get uh, pushed up into the atmosphere. Um, and so that, you know, that sort of strikes me as, as a perfect kind of example of the experimental mode outside the laboratory and society. But one of the things that that does, that recognition does, is it brings the process and the reality of regulation to knowledge creation rather than to something else. And I'm wondering if you might reflect on that. I mean, it's a big question. Maybe we should keep it also for our discussion later. I mean, I would fully agree, though, that, uh, and it doesn't even really matter whether it's nano, whether we call it nano or not, that, uh, that uh, environmental interventions, uh, ecological restoration projects, geoengineering, are a prime example of what is meant here by, by experimentation, and that it also requires somehow that knowledge production and the observation of the experiment, you know, really go hand in hand. Um, I think I'll, we'll wait.